On the breakfast, a Fanny Fair Yoruba social political organization with her leader, Ayo Adebajo, has thrown their weights behind Peter Obi, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, LP, who will be speaking to a chieftain of the group. Also on the breakfast, Nigeria has confirmed 357 new cases of COVID-19 amid the wave of fresh infection resurging in parts of the country. Would there be a fifth wave? And as always, we'll be looking through today's papers, analyzing the biggest stories of the day. Welcome to The Breakfast. I am Messi Abopo. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, Thursday morning right here. Traffic has not ended. I mean, it's quite difficult uh, for those who are moving uh, from one point to the other, trying to get to their different destination, their offices and business point. It's really crazy. But yesterday, there was a sun. I mean, the sun actually set yesterday and was super excited about that, if you live in Lagos. But however, we, hit, we head straight to our top trending conversation. And first on the list is a report, an investigative report by David Undei, who is uh, an, a journalist, a vest, an investigative journalist, an independent one at that. Now, um, this report talks about uh, or exposes an alleged drug link to uh, the flag bearer of the All Progressive Congress and the former governor of Lagos State, Bola Ahmad Tunubu. Now, the article talks about the APC presidential flag bearer being indicted, you know, in the early 90s uh, for laundering money on behalf of uh, a drug king and all of that drug trafficking in Chicago. This has generated too many conversations, I mean, for the first time. Not necessarily because I'm sure that we've had different times where you have uh, the social media and different parts buzzing yesterday and up until this morning. There's so much about uh, the reaction that's coming. P people are on two sides of the divide. Those who actually believe it and those who don't believe it and uh, what have you. There's also another hashtag that's also on the trend, even though you have Donald Trump on that one, but that's not our concern. But really it talks about a video that's leaked or an audio that's been leaked. And it's related to the fact that there's been spaces on Twitter, you would know uh, there were several spaces talking about uh, the drug lord and uh, Bola Tinubu being part of a drug gang or drug lord, what have you. Uh, there's another audio that was leaked. It talks about him uh, being part of that space. And some people who have argued that it was not the one because, I mean, he sounds so relaxed. His voice was very smooth. You can actually tell when he's speaking. But some people say that this is the relaxed part, uh, you know, a relaxed person. When Bolotin was relaxed, that's the voice. I mean, how do people even get to know people this much? But um, I tell you that this is really strong because uh, that article talks about a lot, not just about Bola Ahmad Tinubu, but also talks about the fact that in the 90s, Nigerians were so influential in global drug trafficking that the United States drug policy had to change. And at the time, you also have uh, a very influential person in Nigeria who uh, contests that he had a link with this drug link uh, or gang, and he won the elections. We're talking about MKO Abiola. Right here, it was even stated. I mean, was was saying uh, what this article talks about. It mentioned him, the fact that he won the elections, and some questions have been popped out. Thirty years after, or counting, uh, are we going to have a repeat? Because at the time he was a presidential candidate, he contested. He contested for an election and then won the election. And now it's also been alleged that you have uh, uh, the APC chieftain, if you want to say, or flag bearer, who's also contesting for. Uh, the office of the vice president, I mean the president under the APC right here. Now, the, there's also argument whether or not this is true, especially when it has to do with David Ondeye. Some people say, oh, uh, it's actually politically motivated at a time where it feels like there's some sentiment uh, towards a certain, you know, aspirant 
for the elections ahead of the 2023. So it's politically motivated. Some people have actually found a lot of loopholes, if you say, uh, been very critical of it. But one thing that stands out is the fact that in this article and in this report, there are a lot of, um, you know, receipts, attachment, documents that are in public space and domain. Now, others would say that there's not been any kind of trial, however you want to look at it. I mean, he's been cleared in 2003, and in 2003, there were publications where the United States said he wasn't found guilty. So it's a lot. I mean, it's so much to grapple with at this point in time. And Nigerians are talking, people are reacting. You have those who are supporting and those who are saying, hey, this is false, this is, polit this is politically motivated, and um, we still stand with Bola Ahmad Tunubu. But in our democracy over time, what I've noticed and what I've seen is that we haven't gotten to a point where we constantly look at people uh, with a moral compass and begin to say, um, because you, ha you are X, Y, Z, there are reports about X, Y, Z. I mean, we're talking about the moral compass here, where the people would say we outrightly, we cannot stand with persons like this. We've seen such things uh, happen in uh, reality TV shows where it's a, it, you know, you want to call it a, an experiment where people uh, get to exper experiment on what they want to stand with, the kind of behavior and attitude. But it has, that hasn't really crept into our political space. But whatever the case is, we're hoping that that's clarity because up until this time, I mean, you want to say, are these things really true? Uh, are they really true? Yes, we know that there are some documents in public space and domain, but is it something to go by? Do we also need uh, the states involved to come and clarify all of this, including the uh, presidential flag bearer of, uh, of the APC? It's so much. And that's why I'm taking a deep breath. But let's move away from that. Uh, another one, very, very sad. It talks about us and our democratic process, especially that we head close to 2023. How many more months before our days counting just before the general elections? It's a video that has made uh, the rounds, a video that surfaced of disposed PVC. And, you know, in that particular video, you can't ascertain where, you know, the location, you can't really talk about the exact location where this video emanated, but you can say that it probably might just be somewhere in the southeast. Not necessarily saying it's in Imo State or it's in uh, Enugu or it's in Anambra or any part of it, but it, it shows a video of uh, uh, PVCs that have been disposed, and then I don't know how uh, this person's actually found these PVCs, but it's, it calls for a lot of worry, uh, a lot of concern because uh, over time there's been report that INEC officers had an attack. Right? There's been an attack on, uh, you know, the umpire, the offices of the umpire across different parts of the Federation, not just limited, you know, to the region now or the southeast. And so 41, according to the report, 41 INEC officers have been under attack in two years and 14 states between 2019 and 2021. And in all of this, Emo State is stopping the log. So yes, that's the video that uh, made the rounds Yes, It's gotten a lot of people talk and react. Uh, these are peevices of those who have registered. And you know, it was dog. They found out that it was somewhere in the gutter. And uh, like, we, like I rightly mentioned, that persons have actually, uh, you know, when it gets the time to cast their vote, would they be able to cast their vote at this point in time? But let's look at the attack. If you have had in record between... Uh, 2019 and 2021, about 41 offices of INEC being attacked and Emo State on top of the chart. The recent one is that of Anambra State. We've seen where um, unknown persons, not state actors, attacking these uh, offices and destabilizing, destroying materials that would be very useful for the elections. And some persons have said that this would undermine, um, you know, the 2023 elections in terms of participation of the people in terms of allowing the people to be part of the process. What happens? I mean, look at that. Let's just even look at that. It's a lot to grapple with. But what happens? I mean, INEC should uh, be able, you know, to have an explanation and let the people understand because it, it would, you know, translate into an attack on democracy. This is a total attack. What happens if you have, uh, you know, the offices of 
those who are saddled with the responsibility, organization are saddled with the responsibility of conducting an election, being under such an attack. Sometimes you find fire attacks, uh, you know, it's been set, uh, these offices are set ablaze and what have you. And, you know, materials for the elections have been destroyed. And what happens? It slows down the process. And with that PVC, really, do, do you see uh, the number that we're looking at right there? number of PVCs on the floor. Do you know what that means? Uh, this is uh, really serious for our democracy. And we're hoping that INEC could swing into action. There should be an explanation and an investigation into this, uh, you know, video that has surfaced on the internet. But we need to, we, we need to be on top of our game. We need to be uh, proactive. We, we cannot constantly react to things. And we, if we have over... Um, you know, period of time, we're looking at two years, you have 41 um, offices been attacked in 14 states. Should we not be proactive? Should we not understand and, you know, up the game as to protecting, uh, you know, these offices? Security is a very major issue. And like I mentioned earlier on, uh, if you constantly have these non-state actors attacking uh, you know, INEC offices in different states, then it is an attack on a uh, democratic process. Because a lot of persons, whether or not you want to agree, would be disenfranchised. And that's it. And uh, just before we move away, and this is very interesting because some people have tagged these as a shade. And so you have uh, an aspirant for, in, in the United Kingdom, that's uh, uh, you know, vying for the position of a prime minister, 42 year old. She's a Nigerian because she grew up here, Kemi. But we take a look at this, and when we return, we continue with the conversation. And running to be prime minister when you're a 42 year old is by definition ambitious. <laughs> but I am ambitious, but for our country and for our party. I chose to become a Conservative MP to serve, and I chose this country because here I could breathe free and I could be everything that I wanted to be. I grew up in Nigeria, and I saw firsthand what happens when politicians are in it for themselves, when they use public money as their private piggy banks, when they promise the earth and pollute not just the air, but the whole political atmosphere with their failure to serve others. I saw what socialism means for millions. It's poverty and broken dreams. I came to Britain determined to make my way in a country where hard work and honest endeavour can take you anywhere. And running to be Prime Minister when you're a 42-year-old is by definition ambitious. <laughs> but I am ambitious, but for our country and for our party. I chose to become a Conservative MP to serve, and I chose this country because here I could breathe free and I could be everything that I wanted to be. I grew up in Nigeria and I saw firsthand what happens when politicians are in it for themselves, when they use public money as their private piggy banks, when they promise the earth and pollute not just the air but the whole political atmosphere with their failure to serve others. I saw what socialism means for millions. It's poverty and broken dreams. Mm -hmm. I came to Britain. Well, that's uh, Kemi Bednark speaking, an aspirant uh, for the position of Prime Minister right there in the United Kingdom. Uh, she's also a Nigerian, and so I'm sure you have that very clear, crystal clear. She talked about her experience in Nigeria and why she's saying that, you know, it's quite different because she has an opportunity to be what she can be in that space and looking at what leadership is in Nigeria, where you constantly have people who do not rep represent the interests of the people constantly, um, you know, taking the resources for their selfish interests and what have you. I mean, the conversation can go on. It was crystal clear. I'm not sure I need to, you know, go through all of that. But uh, it hasn't really, really been fantastic with some people in Nigeria because if you look at the comments and saying, hey, why do you have to drag Nigeria into this conversation? Uh, do you really have to, you know, say this for you to make a point? But... Did she say um, the things that she actually mentioned, especially, you know, with Nigerian leadership, uh, are, are these uh, really statement of truth or 
is just a statement. Um, what exactly? Because I think that that's a lot of uh, patriotism from those who are commenting and saying, hey, you don't have to put us in that light just to make a point and at the end of the day, but whatever the case is. Apart from that, you know, Kemi also has been known for uh, bad enough, has been known for an anti-critical race theory campaign. Let's not forget that uh, she's been, you know, a minister of equality in, the, in, in Britain and uh, she has been known for all of this speech that talks about, you know, the issue of white privileges. Uh, there was a video also that surfaced and people have been reacting about her comment and thoughts about uh, white privileges not to be taught in school because that would be breaking the law uh, due to some inherited guilt, racial guilt and what have you. I mean, it just shows you uh, where it is, but it feels like we just lost one and there are too many Nigerians who are on this uh, particular stand and position. Well, that's it on our top trending this morning. We'll take a break and when we return, it'll be time for us to delve into the front pages of our national dailies where we'll bring you great insight and uh, perspective. Please stay with us.